We're now going to hand over to Judith McKenzie and her management team, first-class fund managers, with whom we have an excellent working relationship. They are going to take us through a presentation on the portfolio. Judith. Thank you, Hugh. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's good to see such a, a, a good turnout, actually. Um, we're going to hopefully provide you with a bit of insight as to what we've been doing with your shareholders' money over the last 12 months or so. And hopefully for prospective interested shareholders, give you a bit of an insight as to how we do things. We really believe in shareholder engagement, and you're going to see that as we go through this presentation and talk about the portfolio. So that is also very true uh, for the companies that we invest in, but also our promise to shareholders. And I don't care if there's two people that attend this or one person that attends it next year or the year after, or 200 or 2,000. We will always have an event where you can meet the managers, all of the managers, you can hear about the portfolio, and you can see the day job that we have been, uh, we've been doing. So this meeting is about holding us accountable. Um, it's about hopefully hearing the conviction in our process and our actions. And it's, it's about hopefully hearing about some, our, our work with some cracking management teams to realise value in an absolutely unloved area of the market. And that has only been, I'm going to use the word enhanced, but it's only been magnified uh, with MIFID II and the, the absence of research. Um, I can see our marketing folk already saying, why are you not following the presentation? We're not very good at following presentations. Um, there will be questions and answers at the end because of that. Um, but first of all, I want to remind you of our promise a year ago. Um, and then we're going to delve into the portfolio and you'll hear from the managers, not just, not just me, that's much more important. So our promise, we, um, we issued 182 pages of prospectus, turgid reading, expensive as well, probably about a thousand pound a page. Sorry, Dan, I don't want to put you in the spot there. But, um, but what it is very good at doing is holding our feet to the fire and reminding us of the promise that we made to investors that time. And just to, just to recap, we said that we would create a portfolio of between 12 and 18 holdings in companies under 150 million market cap <laughs> that would take strategic positions of between 3 and 25% of the company. This, this is the bit that we're at now, I suppose, that drive engagement and the catalyst with management for creation of non-correlated index returns. And the most important bit, because um, we're all in this to make money over the long term, that we we could drive 15% compound returns over the long term, that five to seven year period. So that's what we want to be held accountable for. And that's what we're going to tell you we've been up to. Annual review is a bit like a school report, really. Um, we are now 78.4% invested in 11 businesses. And we, we're going to talk about the larger ones, um, but we're very, very happy to talk about all of them. We won't be able to do it in 45 minutes. We are here afterwards, so you can take us offline if you want to do that. Um, they represent, we believe, attractive value opportunities. Um, but it's fair enough buying value, you've got to realise value, and that's really what we get paid to do. Real Good Food, um, which was uh, certainly one of our first investments and one of our problem children, um, got to be honest about it. Um, we're now on a track to realise value out of that. We can talk about where we are with it. Nav decline is disappointing, but we believe this has largely been because uh, of sentiment as opposed to actuals within the portfolio. Our job is to get that value realised and hopefully we'll show you some of the catalysts that we're deploying to do that. It's a cheap portfolio. You look at some of the micro cap, small cap funds out there on 30, 40 times earnings. We're on eight, eight times and we're uh, on a price book of uh, 1.5. And our margin of safety, i.e. where the share prices of the current businesses in the portfolio sit at a discount to where we believe uh, the intrinsic value lies is over 42%. So that's where we believe the upside is going to come from. Microcaps and the market, it's pretty tough out there. And it's always been tough, and that's why we like investing in this area. But what we found is that, uh, as we expected with MIFID, that research is drying up. We don't really mind that too much because we can do our own homework. And we don't really, we're not too dependent on analyst research. But what it does mean is that private shareholders, other institutions may not be getting access to that research. And it means that companies can get trapped in that value zone for quite some time. 
And it's quite interesting that the number of analysts covering our universe under 150 million market cap is, is 0.6 of an analyst. I've got no idea what 0.6 of an analyst looks like. But this time last year, it was 0.8 of an analyst. So that number is going down. The research is drying up. And that is an issue for liquidity and microcaps. This is us. Um, you have three of us here today. Alix is uh, sadly not well, but we are a slightly different team. And I think as you come on, we come on and talk about the individual portfolio companies, you'll get to see um, our, uh, the different dynamics of uh, the team in action. And um, we sit down every single week. Well, we sit together as a team every day, uh, but we sit down every week and we um, discuss the portfolio. We are now spending circa 90% of our time on this portfolio and we know what we need to do. And I'll tell you at the end as to what, what we expect to be reporting on this time next year. Portfolio review, this is the good bit. So this is it. Um, this is where we are with this portfolio. Um, so you have obviously the company name, the sector, market cap, median market cap is about 59, I think, at the moment. And the percentage of the trust, but also the percentage of the company that Downing own. And that's quite important because it shows the influence, the carrot and the stick that we can use with management teams to help drive this value. So we've got everything from a 5% position right the way through to a 22.8% um, position. And of course, in Real Good Food, we have um, some, some loan notes. And each one of these companies, in terms of portfolio construction, they have, this is not really a word, but they have a different level of strategicness. So something like Real Good Food, where we're on the board and we have loan notes, is maybe a little bit different to an adept telecom, uh, where we've got a good relationship with the management team, it's earnings accretive in, in terms of its growth over the last few years, and it's a, it's a level of engagement where we're tweaking around the edges as opposed to um, hitting over the head. So here we go, this is the one. Um, Real Good Food has been, um, has been, I suppose, the elephant in the room in terms of uh, performance. You never like to see a share price graph like that. And we can't say that we planned th this when we invested in the company on the 29th of June last year. However, what we can see is the structure that we put in place. Um, we have uh, our, the bulk of our money in secured loan notes. I sit on the board. I wouldn't normally sit on the board of any of our investees. And we, um, we have a, a direct influence in the corporate governance of this company. Now, we did that because we knew that there were corporate, govern corporate governance issues to address. And we, um, we wanted the equity, but we actually felt that our, um, our influence would be better served by holding a loan note where we could uh, get some return through the loan note, but also have that downside security. So this business, just to describe it very, very briefly, um, five divisions literally had been thrown together over a period of about 12 or 13 uh, years, um, been highly acquisitive, not really any real attention paid to um, uh, the central cost, the bit in the middle, but great little brand businesses in their own right. A business called Renshaw, which is if anybody's into baking cakes and you buy sugar paste, um, it's a, it is literally the brand um, that is in the UK, uh, predominant in the UK. 60 odd million turnover business, 15% margins. So a lot, an awful lot to like. Uh, and that's just one of the business. They also own Brighter Foods, which is a manufacturer of um, formulations and bars for Slimming World. They own all the IP around that. Uh, that throws off three and a half million pounds of cash. Nice little business in its own, own right. Cadence, 14, 12, 13 million of assets, uh, sitting in devices, servicing Marks and Spencers and Waitrose, have done for 30 years. Again, a nice business. A uh, uh, sugar trading business called Garrett's and uh, RW Scott, which is a, a sugar, uh, a jam business based up in Scotland. And our investment case here seems pretty simple because we looked at the sum of the parts. We could pull the accounts from, uh, subsid subsidiary accounts from companies' house and you could see what the, what the attributes were of these separate businesses. You could then see that there was about four and a half million worth of potentially surplus costs at the central cost line, because it had been quite decadent. And it, it didn't take a rocket science to figure out it had been decadent. You go up to their facility in Wavertree in Liverpool, and Hugh was up with us last week having a look at it. It's palatial. The CEO's uh, office was about half the size of this and lots of wood panelling. So it's, and Bill Roy and Bosch lose, that kind of thing. So when we were going around looking at what 
what you could do in terms of value creation for shareholders, it, it looked blindingly obvious. Now, we, the, the board was, um, choose my words carefully, um, the board was quite cosy. We knew there were governance issues. Uh, we had tacit understanding and agreement with the two main shareholders who, one's a family office and one's a Mauritian sugar business, not your normal institutional shareholders. Um, but we had a tacit agreement with them that actually they were a bit bored of this decadence. They, want, they saw the value in the businesses a bit like we did, and they wanted to go down a route where ultimately they would realise value from the separate assets. So, sounds like a fantastic plan, doesn't it? Some of the parts, tick. Central cost to take out, tick. Um, governance, but we sit on the board and we've got a loan note, tick. And I think what, um, what you always underestimate in these situations is that when there has been a degree of decadence for a number of years, and you know that there are corporate governance issues, they're probably more than you think. And once you actually start peeling back the onion, that was certainly the case with this, with this company. Um, within a very short period of time, within about three weeks, of, we didn't even have a board meeting, but it became apparent to me, and I don't quite know what the trigger was, but I was um, aware that it was probable that Peter Totty, the CEO at the time, was being paid more than was disclosed in the accounts. And that wasn't a good day. And when I interviewed the other non-exec directors, um, one in particular, no longer with us, said, um, well, yes, he liked to get paid £500,000 a year, and we knew that shareholders wouldn't like that. That's served to be shot, literally. So um, CEO uh, departed without condition, uh, a non-exec departed without condition, and thanks to the, the structure of our loan note and our ability to um, influence, we put in BDO Forensic uh, into, the, um, into the company for three months to make sure that things hadn't been misaccounted for, and they haven't been. They just elected not to tell shareholders like us. Um, so disappointing, but actually when we, uh, the, the other good thing about having um, the, the power that we did through the loan note and the board seat was that I could, I could call a friend, <laughs> and I say a friend, I could call somebody that knows how to do turnarounds and knows how to um, engage with teams like this. Uh, where you have to uh, realise value. And so therefore I called a chap called Hugh Colley, who I'd worked with in a business called Office to Office. And if you think real good food's difficult, you should have seen Office to Office. It was the ex-Her Majesty's uh, stationery office, which had been um, taken on to market by private equity by Electra, geared up, and then of course had gone through the recession. Low margin business, quite difficult. And he, he'd, uh, he'd done quite a good job on that. We sold it to August Capital and we, um, uh, we got a, a nice 40% IRR out of it. And he had done a similar thing in Dawson Holdings. I hadn't been a shareholder there, but Dawson was an equally awkward business. Uh, Hugh came on as non-exec in August. Uh, we appointed a new FD, finance function was tidied up. Um, and Hugh then subsequently went in as CEO on the 1st of January this year. As soon as you part, start putting out announcements on uh, companies that haven't um, disclosed things in their accounts, quite rightly, customers go, what on earth is happening? If, does that mean there's fraud? Does it mean that their management team is crooked? Does it, all sorts of connotations come from that. And the announcement that we had to put out literally on that day in August where I had to whistle blow to um, the Nomad and the AIM team was, was horrible. Uh, no wonder the share price fell. There we go. That's that. that. That lovely um, spike down the words and not up the way. Um, and what we found was that our suppliers and Marks and Spencers and Waitrose said, well, wait a minute, what's happening here? You're not on 60-day terms anymore, you're on 30-day terms. In fact, you're on 15-day terms. And, and wait a minute, actually, we're delivering X amount of sugar to you tomorrow. Uh, can you just pay up front? So all of a sudden, there was a creditor stretch. And that's what this bit, this horrible bit in the middle reflects. So we, as, as shareholders, um, we, we had to react quickly. We had to figure out if it was uh, worth funding or not, quite bluntly. Had we made a mistake? Was the sum of the parts still there? Um, Hugh and Harveen uh, going into CEO and CFO really helped us in that regard because they, they had no emotional attachment with it. Uh, they just wanted to make sure their careers didn't fail uh, with, with real good food. So they, were, they did a lot of grunt work around about um, the sum of the parts argument and what we could take out the central costs. 
And so that period in the middle, um, where I was probably spending a day, two days a week with the business, was that sorting out period. And I don't want to sound flippant about it now, but where we are at this juncture, I feel a lot more comfortable about the business. The sum of the parts argument in Downing's view certainly stacks up. There is equity value to go for. We have optimized our in price by refinancing the loan notes, changing the coupon. We have put in place a convertible loan note that converts at 5p. Um, and that still has to go through whitewash. So we believe that we've optimized in a, in a difficult situation our in price. Now we have to demonstrate to you what we can do with it. And we've already made one sale of um, Garrett's, the sugar ingredient business. And I maybe guess by the way I'm talking about this and the shareholder mentality in terms of the core, the core shareholders, I wouldn't guess that this will be in its current form in the next year to two years. So please hold us accountable on this. You will no doubt hear us updating you through our investment letters. It is work in progress, but we've now got to a position where the company is stable, got a good management team in place and everything to play for in terms of uh, value realization. No doubt take questions at the end on that one. Nick. Gamma Aviation. Uh, you know, what is the business? Essentially, a, a business aviation uh, support services company um, with two divisions, uh, an air segment and, and uh, a maintenance segment. Um, what does that actually mean? Um, why do we like this business? Um, you know, actually, you're taking it a step back, how do we look for companies and where do we see value? A lot of the time is in uh, opportunities where the market misunderstands what a business is. And because of that misunderstanding, they, uh, they apply a, a low multiple to the earnings of the company. And, and that's what we see in Gamma. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a perception, we think, that this is a, a charter business in, in business aviation. Uh, it's a cyclical business, it's low margin, and uh, we don't think that it's, uh, it's any of those things. Um, you know, the bit that I think people have issue with uh, is the air business. Um, we, you know, you know, I think the perception is that, that, that it's an airline. Uh, you know, the fact is that Gamma doesn't actually own any of these assets. It is an asset manager for owners of assets. And in being an asset manager and in being the, uh, the second largest uh, business aviation services uh, company globally, it's, it's a quality business, it's a quality asset manager of those assets. Because of the management fees that it takes, you think that business is quite sticky, uh, less cyclical than it would be otherwise if it was a charter business. Um, <clears throat> so that's the misunderstanding uh, on the area business. The other part, the maintenance business, exactly what it says in the tin, um, <clears throat> it sells uh, uh, time, labor, and, and parts into business jets that need uh, essential maintenance. Again, you know, we, we see that side of the business as being quite visible. Um, you know, whether or not these, these assets are utilized, uh, either as a base load of, of airworthy maintenance, which has to be done, and, and things like avionics, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so we think that that's also uh, quite visible. Um, the opportunity, how we got involved, uh, <coughs> we, we took an initial uh, position in the summer last year. Um, what we identified was a large opportunity to consolidate um, this, this market. So if we think of, of Gamma being, being uh, number two globally, we think that actually only backs out to a market share of just over 2%, um, the, the largest. Is, is about 4%. Um, so there's a long tail of small companies to be consolidated uh, in this space. And we think Gamma, being the only publicly listed uh, business, has the access to capital to do that. We took our initial position back in summer. We then <coughs> topped up uh, just at the beginning of this year. There was a large institutional placing, uh, 48 million pounds for the, the company to go and uh, pursue uh, organic and inorganic opportunities. Um, uh, essentially what that meant was building out the value chain uh, in locations like the US, the Middle East and in Asia uh, where they, they didn't have the full 
subset uh, of, of opportunities like they do uh, closer to home in the UK. Um, so what do we see over the, the kind of short to midterm? Um, <clears throat> the uh, business still has about $27 million cash uh, to deploy. Um, and we think that that should be done uh, hopefully by the end of this year. Um, the opportunity on the back of that we think is about uh, $10 million worth of bolt-on PBT. Uh, we think that the, uh, the, the, the PLC um, underlying PBT last year was about $17 million. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're bolting on about 10 the deployment of that capital. Uh, and there's organic you know, margin opportunities there as well, which we think are worth about $9 million uh, on top. You know, a lot of that will depend on scale, but we think that the scale will come with the deployment of, of capital uh, alongside. And again, uh, you know, long-term opportunity is, is you know, to con continue this consolidation. Um, yeah, I mean, we talk about exits. <clears throat> we don't think that this will be an obvious exit to another player in the sector, given its skill. We think that, you know, as the uh, the business continues to expand earnings, uh, you know, the market will pick up on the fact that this isn't, you know, a cyclical charter business. It doesn't deserve to be uh, capitalized on on eight times forward earnings. It should be more like, you know, hopefully fourteen or fifteen times. And you know, in that and, and the liquidity that higher market cap uh, will, will come alongside that, you know, we, we might be able to exit this into the market. Um, it, it's worth pointing. Sorry, Nick, jumping in. It's worth pointing out. It's, it's not. It's not just us that found this this attractive. From a trade perspective, uh, Hutch took a twenty percent mm. shareholding in the fundries uh, in um, January February. So they, they clearly have an interest in the Far East where uh, Gamma are doing a lot of, a lot of new work and, and probably making acquisitions. Mm. Whether what that ends up as being, who yeah. knows? Um, you know, you always kind of ask yourself the questions, are we the only ones that see uh, opportunity in these companies? You know, why are we swimming against the tide here? And to see Hutch come in with a 21% stake back in, back in Feb, you know, we think that you know, should be a key catalyst going Sorry, forward. that's Hutchison. Uh, Hutchison Wampoa. Yeah. Um, you know, not just because they see the opportunity, but also the ability of Hutch and Hutch's involvement. They've now got uh, a man on the board, Simon Toe. Uh, you know, but, but their involvement and their alignment to, to develop the business in Asia, and that's where we think that they will be key. You know, Asia's a, a burgeoning market in, in business aviation, and where Gamma's starting on you know, a, a low base. Uh, you know, there's only a, a, a handful of jets that they, they have there just now. So big opportunity there. Good. Good. Thank you. James. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Lynch. So we've heard some really interesting examples thus far of the types of investments that we have been getting involved with over the last 18 months. Um, so real good food, much more engaged and probably an extreme example of the level of work that we have to do when you're in investing in this style. Um, Gamma Aviation, a really good example of a high quality uh, business in terms of revenue, but a business that has been misunderstood by the wider marketplace. And we're working with, Nick's working very closely with the management team to help reposition the communication around that business. And ADEPT is probably the next step on from that um, in that we've known this business for a very long time, so over 10 years. And it's been through a bit of a transformation over that period and is now in a place where it is fairly well understood by the market, um, but the opportunity remains for it to continue de deploying its strategy um, for the next five to seven years in line with the gestation period that we've outlined for the investment trust. So Adept Telecom itself, uh, it, in its previous life, was a traditional fixed line telecoms operator. Uh, so the telecoms industry as a whole has been through a period of flux. 
over the last 20 years, really, as, as technology has evolved. And fortunately, uh, Ian Fishwick, the, the, the CEO, was very aware of these changes as they were coming forward. He's very connected to the industry. And so um, about 10 to 15 years ago, he, he began transitioning that business away from a fixed line telecoms operator, which ultimately is in decline at a rate of low single digits, so two to 4%, towards a much higher quality revenue stream. So managed services uh, being the, well, the lion's share of the business now. So I'm going from 100% fixed line to now over 50% managed services. That has a knock on effect of uh, increasing margins. So they have one of the highest EBITDA margins in the space in excess of 20% and convert that to cash at approximately 80%. So very cash generative. That means that this business has been able to compound earnings uh, as well as the dividend stream that goes alongside it at about 10% annualized. So there's been a natural organic uh, earnings progression but that has been augmented with an M&A strategy. So there is the opportunity to consolidate uh, a number of smaller businesses within the, the managed services space uh, and integrate them into the, the wider infrastructure of the group. Um, so typically, Adept has been able to buy these businesses at kind of four, six times, no more than kind of seven times earnings. And the rating on the business currently is, is 13 times forward. So you can see that there's a natural multiple arbitrage there along the way. Um, and we can see this from you know, the, the most kind of recent acquisition here. So Atom Wired coming through in uh, the, the second half of last year. Um, so remembering that I, I said that the, the business started off as a fixed line telecoms provider, Atomwide provides IT solutions into 4,000 schools. So very different in terms of the proposition that they're bringing to the market here and far stickier in terms of revenue stream. On the face of it, providing internet to schools doesn't sound particularly attractive, but once you consider the level of customization that has to go around those different portals around each individual school, you realize that the time and money that goes into uh, kind of onboarding these clients means that they're very unlikely to change uh, provider into the future. So that said, we're, we're very close to the board and, um, uh, uh, and we're happy to put our support behind Chris Kingspan as he, as he, as he came in and was, um, was appointed as the new NED. He also then went on to buy a significant shareholding along the way. Um, but through the early part of this year, you'll see that there's been a bit of share price weakness. Um, and at that point, in line with our investment process, as our intrinsic value remains the same, our target price remains the same, uh, and the share price falls away, our margin of safety increases, and therefore we have a higher level of conviction uh, in that proposition, and we're able to top up our holding along the way. So as we look towards the, uh, the opportunities for the business going forward, we see that actually there are a number of synergies that can come through, through the acquisitions that have been made to date. Um, there are obviously back office functions that can be centralized within the group, uh, and then as we look further ahead, there continues to be a wealth of consolidation opportunities into the medium and longer term. So continuing to buy high quality revenue stream managed service businesses on lower multiples and absorb them into the wider group and in essence gaining the, the benefits of that multiple arbitrage. Um, so a slightly different example of how we're able to be very engaged with the management team and uh, influence the strategy into, into the longer term. Um, and you can see that there are different, so the level of risk management across the portfolio is well executed and, uh, and robust along the way. Do you want to add anything on that? Uh, I don't know, I think I might skip about just for some fun. Yeah, okay. um, so I think what, what you can see, or you can really see that there's a flavor of some good companies, you can see why we might have invested in them. 
the, the problem is that you know these are sort of ugly ducklings when it comes to the my, the microcap space is difficult in its own right, and then you have companies that for whatever reason are not maybe very good at going out and shouting about themselves. So uh, I talked about some of the tweaking around the edges on on things that we can do with the likes of Adept and working with Ian. You know, should there be a change of broker here? Should there be another PR company involved in it? These are the questions that you know we ask of the management team. They need to, why are they sitting at a discount to their peer group when they've got better quality of earnings and nobody really cares about it? You probably hadn't even heard about it until today. So that's, that's the sort of challenge that we have uh, in, in terms of getting, getting the word out there um, and getting some of these companies better rated. And the reality is that, and I'm sure if Ian was here, he would, he would agree with me, um, he, he acts like an owner manager of his own business. And that's, that's a great attribute because he lives and dies by the sword in terms of the, the strategy that he deploys. It's his own money. But because of that mentality, they tend not to care too much about the share price. So we have to actually show them the value of caring about that share price and why it is actually currency for them if they want to go on and do a bigger acquisition. And in some of the basics, um, we, and it does, it, it, we were talking about it as a board this morning. In all of these companies, the, the management teams are not very market savvy. They're not really sure how, how to present themselves. We can help a little bit with that. It, it will make a difference. And I think we'll, we'll probably start to see that. And, and Ian now has suddenly woken up to that idea. That's why he's engaging with us. And, um, we gave him a pitch the other day on how he should pre present his company. I'm not saying we've got it right, but at least he's thinking about it. Hargreaves Services, another. We like to look at companies that most other people don't like looking at. And this is one, uh, this used to be a seven, eight hundred million odd market cap company. Um, you, you can probably remember it in the day then when it was uh, the UK's largest distributor of coal. Um, we all know what's happened to coal. And so therefore, it had to reinvent itself a little bit. Um, so we, and the way that they reinvented themselves, they, they invested uh, in renewable assets, which looked good. Um, and they also started to uh, fill in their coal mines and so therefore created quite a decent land bank. That was quite easy for us to um, look at and value from a NAV play. And we believe that there's a, at least 30 to 50% um, uplift in um, on a NAV play within this company. The problem was that um, we had a bit of an issue when it came to, it's fair enough having a look at a NAV play, but how on earth are you going to get the cash back shareholders? And that was quite true in this case. So um, we tried to engage with management to persuade them that actually what they should do is start selling off assets and basically pay special dividends and, and reward shareholders. They, they weren't really that keen on that idea. Um, and we, uh, if you look at the report accounts from last year, they sold off about 24.6 million of assets, coal um, infrastructure assets, and that went straight back into the company instead of being a special dividend. So there was a lot not to like and get frustrated about with this company. However, you know, shareholders uh, do have a vote and um, we, uh, we helped engage with some of the other shareholders who'd been in involved for quite a period of time and uh, we took a bit of a stake just to so show that we were serious. And um, the other shareholders agreed with us. We have therefore managed to, uh, the board has appointed, should I say, um, a, a, a fairly um, good player in the AIM space called Roger McDowell, who is currently chairman of Avingtrans. And I don't know if you know Avingtrans, he, well, he did a nice split up there and returned cash to shareholders. Um, he has gone in as non-exec here and I think probably in the next couple of weeks at the AGM he steps up to chairman. Hopefully we don't need to do too much more now. So the game plan here is to return excess cash to shareholders. Um, there are three or four shareholders that account for um, close to 40% of the business. We've got an understanding from the board that um, Roger will be allowed to uh, engage in a strategy that maximises shareholder value. <laughs> And there's a lot of little companies like this on AIM where um, you do need to get your hands dirty, you do need to engage with other shareholders um, and, and get them to, to actually realise that they're accountable to everybody, not just, not just their, their own salaries. Um, I'm slightly mindful of time. If there's anybody that wants to speak about something specific in the portfolio that we haven't spoken about already, then I'll take questions.
Yes, one, one question. Um, I've been a follower of Roger McDowell for a long time. Has he taken a personal stake in uh, Hargreaves? That's a very good question. Hmm. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. Thank he, you. So ev every other position that he is involved in, he has always taken a significant, uh, more than six-figure investment, as you'll probably know. So it would be very odd for him not to be doing that. Okay, so thought. it's a question of when the time is right from his point of view. But perhaps this isn't the right time for the question, but uh, uh, you mentioned that Adept um, you know, don't really value their share price. And I often come across this with companies. W what are the sorts of um, reasons, do you think, that companies have this? Is it a fear or...? No, I, I think it's very simple. It's much more simple than that. So Ian and his family and his, his family trust own a significant part of the business. He, oh, he cares about the share price on the day that the business exits. And, and that's, that's, that's it. The market is a medium, I think, for, for them in the meantime. They, a lot of these companies, and Adept was an, a really good example of this, came to market probably a little bit too early, as back in 2006, came on the back of over-ambitious forecasts in a bull market, and um, probably got promised that they could be in the FTSE 250 within a couple of years. Um, with a board at that juncture as well that maybe wasn't quite fit for purpose. The profits warned within, in fact, the, the profits warned within six months. So you profits warned within six months of coming to the market. We've seen it with various things over the last couple of months, actually. And their share price fell by 60 or 70 percent. And they, they, they were left in a no man's land for a, a long period of time. They were also overgeared. Um, so Ian, um, Ian knew what he had to do. He had to de-gear. And he had to deliver earnings and uh, organic growth and, and stick to his acquisition strategy. So in credit to him, he just got his head down and did exactly that. But actually what he's ended up doing is building a 75, 80 or million market cap company that really should be on the radar of most IHT funds. Or, or, uh, I spoke to him the other day. He had never been introduced to any of the 28 uh, IHT providers. So uh, somebody's not doing their job. But it's not, does, can, can, does Ian know the questions to ask of his broker? Or does Ian know how to, um, well, actually, in fairness, he went to Mellow and he did a presentation there, which was great. So he's getting it now. But we have to, I've been bleating away to um, the chief exec there, Ian, for the last two and a half years. And it's, it's now hitting home. And it's hitting home because, well, maybe he's getting a bit older. Maybe he is beginning to think about exit. And the exit will be at a multiple of his share price, not just what a trade buyer pays for it. They will look, it's a barometer. So it's, it, there is a real education exercise to, to go through with some of these companies. And, and, and it's not, Marwin's the same at, uh, at Gamma. Doesn't, he doesn't quite realise the impact of putting out an RNS that might not be the best worded. You have to point it out to them and then they go, oh gosh, right, I see what you mean. That's why the share price went down. We thought it would go up on the back of that. So they're not thinking as shareholders. We're thinking as, as collectively as shareholders, but it's trying to get these owner managers who are great at running their businesses to start thinking that actually they need to think in that same way. So uh, it, it sounds flippant, but doing, doing some of that mentoring, spending time with uh, management teams, well, I'm, I'm pretty confident will begin to make uh, a bit of a difference in some of these companies. And there is a common theme, there really is. But that should be the easy stuff to do. The Red Halls and the highly strategic, like Hargreaves, are the ones where we need to exercise our muscles and get our, our hands dirty. But on good value quality companies that should be on people's radars, that's, that's a bit of a PR marketing exercise. Why, why do you think it is? Or have you had any? I think that some people are just maybe fearful of being asked questions and being put under the spotlight, or they you know, don't have enough skin in the game, which is perhaps why Mark was asking that mm -hmm. question. Uh, yeah, but they uh, seem to, there's often one board member who you know, is dragging his feet and is maybe sort of back chatting against the idea of being more engaging. And once you can find that person and try to persuade them, but it's trying to find that individual, there's somebody somewhere an advisor, or, yeah, it's really frustrating. I absolutely agree, and we we in we interview all the non-execs 
before we make investments. Um, we clearly spend a bit of time with the chairman and the quality of the boards in this area of the market isn't that great. We frequently get a uh, kickback when we ask for even a phone call with a non-exec saying, why would a non-exec speak to shareholders? Uh, which I find, well, we, we tend not to take those companies any further. But just, just very quickly, Synetics is probably a good example. This is a, the old Quadnetics business. I don't know if you, you've ever come across it, but Synetics is um, a leader in uh, integration and management of advanced security systems. Nice little business, been around for a number of years. It went through a bit of a tough period about um, uh, about three, four years ago, but did all the right things in terms of cutting costs, restructured their business to focus more on gaming. Um, nice order book, great operational gearing that could come through, strategic opportunities uh, in the market. But here you had the, the tenure of the board, and, I, and I, I say this almost with a smile on my face, 128 years collective tenure on the board. Chairman been in place for 26 years. Nothing, you know, they, they're, there's nothing wrong with, with these guys. You know, they, they're, they're honest, sensible people. But if you've been in place for that period of time, then you're probably, you're, you're not asleep at the field, but you're probably not as engaged as somebody that's maybe a bit younger. And that, that but in fairness to that chairman, you've already seen that a non-exec has left. And we've, you know, there's great engagement with that board. And it's a, a lovely little business. It's got uh, us as shareholders. It's got, in fact, I think we may be the only institutional shareholder. But with the, it's got net cash in the balance sheet, operational gearing, really stock dealer brokers to it, really modest forecasts that are in the market. Never try and overshoot, um, under deliver and, I uh, always get that wrong, under deliver. Over deliver and under shoot, uh, under promise. Um, so, and great markets uh, to go for in terms of transport. So, but again, you know, that could lie in the portfolio for the next five, 10 years and still be at a discount to what we believe the intrinsic value is. We've got to have the catalysts, the mechanisms, the engagement with management to, and the alignment to, to, to be able to push some of these things through and ultimately everybody benefits. Um, hopefully it gives you a bit of a flavour of uh, what we've been doing for the last 12 months and um, we, we've used the phrases of uh, unloved, overlooked, um, ugly ducklings uh, various times and I think probably a dangerous analogy to make and excuse me for this but it's a bit like the dating game to a certain extent and you, you can't help but draw some of those same conclusions. If you think about it, we're, what we're talking about is that we want to find companies with the same values as us, management teams of integrity and transparency. You want that in a partner, don't you? Well, most of the time. Um, we like cash flows and balance sheets. You certainly want that in your partner. Um, you want alignment and you want resilience and uh, longevity for, for over the long term. And especially in markets like this at the moment, it's very easy to go out and find the, the well-loved, sexy stock that's gone off to the races. And that's not what we do. We go off and find the ugly ducklings, the ones that um, need a bit of help around the edges and, and sometimes maybe a bit, of, bit more help than we think around the edges. Um, and we like doing our own digging and finding that we don't need to sacrifice too much to, dare I say it, get into bed with companies that we believe are good value. So um, we told you what we've been, up, we've been up to over the last 12 months and our job now is to demonstrate that those little unloved ugly ducklings uh, can trim their long beards, get rid of their chinos, get out their loafers and sorry for anybody wearing loafers here um, and we can actually make them a bit more market facing. Uh, we believe we've got the tools in the toolbox to be able to do it. We've got engaged, aligned management teams to do it. We've got more strategic situations where we will be involved, making sure that the management do the right thing. But more often, but we're buying companies on cheap valuations that have got good earnings. We need to show you and demonstrate that we can drive those, both the earnings, but most importantly, the catalyst over the next 12 months. Thank you. I thought I'd just sum up in a couple of words to say that this is a remarkably active fund management team. So what you have got is value investing and going to the gentleman's question at the back, sometimes it is value investing in companies which really have become 
rather owner-managed. But value investing by a management team that brings about remarkable change. You have seen on the uh, charts put up some of that change. I think I would be right in saying that every single uh, one of our investments is one in which the board and the management are under quite close examination from the management team here. And there has been considerable change brought about not in a rough-handed way, but in a remarkable, skillful, smiling way, which is hugely, hugely important. So not only is there more value today in those companies than when the original investments were made, there is now more potential for that value to be shown, increasingly more competent boards of directors a new chairman. And it is, as Judith put it, up to us, because I combined the board with the managers, it's us to, up to us to demonstrate that that extra value is going to come through. Just finally, I would encourage you all, if you are not already on the mailing list for our quarterly investment newsletters, or investment letters, they're quite substantial, please go on the website and get yourself on the mailing list. Fact sheet coming out shortly. Go on the website, get familiar with the website, and begin to see some of the videos that are going on there and some of what this team is about, because it is remarkable. There are no other investment trusts in my knowledge, which have this amount of hands-on involvement. I think it's a terrific team.